the beginning when I presented the first paper with the network, one way to, to translate the fact that the network can change over time, okay, it was to have a, a short film with a different network uh, uh, represented and then s s showing that really what you observe in terms of network, the visual representation of the network with the changing color, the changing ages and so on, was something really able to represent what was happening that time in, uh, in the financial markets. Okay. Some colleagues told me that it was also the case to add, at the beginning there was the images, then there was music. <laughs> Someone told me, you can also add dance. I was thinking to this now, <laughs> where I was waiting, but uh, not able to, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> it was just to... <laughs> Since really at the beginning was first the, the images, then some music, since my co-author Andrew Law at that time decided that it was the case to put out some music. Here we are, thank you. <laughs> and then someone suggested also some dance. Okay. Oh, okay, here we are, we can start again. Thank you. <laughs> and then, uh, as I said, uh, um, Thank you for confirming also that, that now you can see. Um, as I said, I mean, then uh, introducing new time variant dynamic network, then uh, in terms of method and models, and then the way in which it is possible to, to work uh, uh, with array data and the application, then clearly application on network data. Then the two papers, as I said, are these two papers where the first that I will present with a little bit more the tail is a multi-layer networks with dynamic but real valued edges and then uh, we here we consider a smooth dynamics and then uh, also some inputs response function uh, will be done and the other paper companion paper where again it is a multi-layer network but in this case with the binary edges and there the attention is more on discrete switching dynamics than on the fact that there can be breaks and and uh, and switch then uh, how it is possible to exploit the information from uh, the structure of the data uh, i mean in the literature a part of you certainly know that uh, when also you can work with a matrix or more complicated data one way is to go through vectorize uh, everything and then to translate something that is a little bit more complicated in uh, uh, more or less standard way. But doing this, uh, what we lose is uh, the information on the structure of the data. And then uh, this is the case, this is, uh, e I mean, when I show you before, I mean, the, the network in terms of, of connectivity, but uh, when we analyze the impact of the topology, what we are saying is that the structure matter is not simply the fact to put together the, uh, the edges in such a way to see what happened or the nodes to see what happened, then the important thing is to maintain and to use the information in the structure of the data. Uh, then uh, this means to, to, to work with tensor data without, uh, I mean, transforming the tensor data in other things. And uh, uh, clearly there is a lot of data to treat uh, a part of them only is relevant, then it is important to be able to account for sparsity since this is the only way in which you can proceed. Then what we propose is dynamic models for tensor data. We account for a different type of data dynamics, as I said uh, before, and in particular, I mean, the, uh, there is also this part on uh, the ability to explore dynamics uh, using uh, shock propagation then inputs response function. And uh, what we practically propose, I mean, on one side is to use tensor, then uh, working with the tensor, and then uh, I, I, I'm obliged to introduce some operational representation of tensor in such a way to be able to, to see uh, what, what is possible to do. And uh, in terms of, uh, 
estimation procedure after we use a Bayesian approach and uh, we use a global local hier hierarchical uh, prior distribution. And this is the fact that uh, on some way we need to use uh, uh, similar structure, the sharing of information among the different priors, and at the same time, we need to, 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 to take care of uh, sparsity, since, uh, as we said before, otherwise it is impossible to work. Um, as I said, why not vectorize, since uh, the estimation become uh, quickly infeasible, since the dimension becomes uh, too high to treat, but uh, e we are losing the information, as I said, and more than that, I mean, since we need to impose some and to work with some uh, sparsity restriction, it is difficult to understand the way in which this is possible to do when you have a vectorized form. While working directly on the, on the matrix, on the tensor form, it is, uh, it is easier. Then uh, the estimation becomes uh, feasible. This is something that you have to see. Uh, it is possible then to maintain the data structure and then to use, to exploit this data structure. And uh, it is possible to, to use tensor also in terms of the type of the composition that you can consider and the operators that you can, uh, that you can work. Practically, uh, the general model that we uh, propose is, uh, it appears, it is a generalization of the linear regression models to the tensor framework. And uh, we, as I said, we need to introduce uh, parsimony in terms of model specification, but at the same time, uh, we need to also learn sparsity patterns from the data in such a way to put together the parsimony on one side, but also the, the sparsity. And uh, clearly, working with uh, sufficient reflection prior definition and uh, using uh, efficient posterior computation, we can uh, obtain the, the result. Here, uh, a few uh, and a quick view on the two, on the two paper. Um, this is the, what we will see uh, later on. Here, as I said before, we work uh, on, uh, I'm not see two, ah, okay. Um, we work with real valued uh, networks uh, graphs and uh, we also want to analyze the shock propagation uh, in time and in space then uh, this is the, the model. As I said, from a really a general view and also the way in which it is written there, you see it is a linear regression, but in, in this case is for tensor time series data. Uh, essentially, we generalize a multivariate linear regression and we um, consider a tensor-valued impulse response analysis. Uh, and what is really important, and this is the common aspect also with the other paper, is to use the parafact tensor decomposition. Clearly, we will see the detail later. And uh, uh, in such a way to have a parsimony, as I said, and to use a hierarchical global local shrinkage prior in order to have sparse coefficients. And the application that they would see is a two-layer network on international trade and capital flow. And uh, as I said, some analysis of the uh, edge shock propagation. The other paper, companion paper, I mean, part from the same uh, observation, let me say, but in this case, it is binary network, then instead of real valued network. And uh, there, the idea is how is it possible to to analyze and to formalize the structural breaks in the network structure. Again, we need to, to, to deal with uh, sparsity. And then uh, here, the model is uh, something that appears a little bit more complicated in the writing, but in practice, it is a zero inflated logic for each entry. And for the parameters, we consider a Markov switch in dynamics, uh, and uh, 
again, the e estimation is through Bayesian inference. Uh, here, we need to use a particular type of data augmentation, the polyagamma. But after, I mean, the two main points are, again, the parafac uh, tensor decomposition in order to have the parsimony, and the Yashica global local shrinkage prior in order to be able to induce and to obtain sparsity for the uh, coefficients. There, the application is for a financial network, in this case for the European institution, and in some way it is an exercise related to the beginning of the history when we worked with network for the financial system and the impact of risk factors and network topology, in this case on edge probability than on the presence of an edge or not. Now, let's start more seriously than on, uh, on the main uh, presentation today than uh, this, uh, this paper. But I, I thought it was important to, to give, I mean, an idea of the old history also on the reason for which we started with, uh, uh, on one side, uh, financial and economic uh, questions and the way in which it was possible to represent through network and then how it, it, it was the case to, to treat the, the data. Data that uh, nowadays are increasing in size than the high dimensionality is uh, a topic. Uh, uh, there is a situation in which it would be the case, it was also in the past, but nowadays it appears more important to treat contemporary multiple data sources than to have different layers and to treat them uh, together. Uh, Example of tensor value data are already there in the literature. As I said, the second, the second uh, point is the, the paper that I cited at the beginning. There, the, it was a temporal network that the relation between uh, among and subjects observed uh, t times. So then, uh, it is a, if you see in such a way, it is a three order tensor, okay, but also in other contexts, not only in, uh, in economics and finance, but but even more on medical data, I mean, it is quite easy to have this type of, uh, of data. Then here it is the, the data on which we will work later, and then is the a layer for trade, and then it is the com trade of uh, then the, the import export among the 10 countries in this case. Uh, the way in which the edge is uh, traced means the direction and then it goes from left to, to right, and the color it is, if it is import or export, then this is the, the way in which you represent. Also the thickness of the, uh, the edges give you the, the relevance and the importance of the export and imports. The second layer is the financial, in this case are um, uh, ex not exchanges are financial uh, linkages in terms of the Bank of International Settlements uh, data. And then uh, what is the idea is to represent uh, a layer for the real part and the trade and a second layer for the financial part. It's just to, to have an idea of the, the way in which the different, it appears more similar. I mean, this, this goes from 2004 to 2016. I mean, it is not a, a long uh, period, but uh, he, I mean, this can also make clear also the way in which it is possible to work, where clearly the dimension is much higher than the sample dimension in uh, in this case. And uh, he, I mean, looking more carefully to the different uh, uh, pictures, it is easy, it is possible to see that there is change in patterns. Uh, looking in this way, it appears more similar, but uh, after we will see also the, the result. As I said, I mean, the, the question is how to model a time series, and this is the, the main point of tensor value data. And then how to, to be able to account for the fact that first, many variables, few of them are relevant then to introduce sparsity and maintaining, using, exploiting the information that comes from the, from the data. 
What we propose is a dynamic model, and we also explore dynamics in terms of uh, shock uh, propagation. What we use is tensor algebra, uh, the use of, uh, as I said, uh, the global local hierarchical prior in order to, to be able to work with the Bayesian method after, and uh, uh, the impulse response analysis. Then here the tensor. Uh, looking in such a way is not so complicated since it is a three, uh, it is a tensor what is represented of order uh, three. Uh, clearly, the order can be even higher. In this case, it is difficult to, to give uh, uh, an idea of what we are discussing, but uh, clearly the way in which you can also describe the here the, the tensor is uh, thinking in terms of slice, uh, then horizontal slice, lateral slice, frontal slice, depends on the way in which you look at the, at the tensor. And also, I mean, what we have the, the habit to say, but it becomes more general if we talk about fibers, then it is column and rows, but then uh, they can be tube and uh, fibers in general, just to, to describe the pieces of the, of the, um, of the tensor. What the tensor algebra do is to generalize the matrix algebra to multiple dimension. And uh, uh, once you are inside the tensor analysis, you see quite easily the extension. At the beginning, it is a little bit more uh, complicated. Let's start from the matricization. The, 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 the words say what we are thinking is how you translate, you transform a tensor in a matrix. Okay, and clearly the way it is formalized, the way in which you have to do, this means to cut the tensor into slices. You have to give the, the dimension of these slices and then to put one, uh, them uh, horizontally in such a way to transform the tensor. You first cut in slices and then you put the slices together. At the end, you have a matrix instead of a, of a tensor. Clearly, there is only one way the dimension change since in the matricization you say the mode k matricization okay then the dimension change but the way we have to to proceed must be the same every time the uh, after there is some tensor operation then the mode n product the mode n product then we have always this calligraphic x that is the the tensor of order n, just to say that we go farther three, uh, and then you can have a matrix or, or a, a vector. The mode n product is defined in such a way, but it is practically impossible to understand what is written there. <laughs> Matteo. <laughs> We know, but the idea is, I mean, you have to, you compute the inner product of each mode n fiber with the matrix of the vector. In practice, what you obtain, what you obtain is that you change the nth dimension since it is a mode n product, then the n, this means, okay? Then you change the nth dimension of the tensor or reduce it of, or, of, one, or, of, of one, okay, when you multiply mode n product with a, with a vector, okay? Other operations are, from this point of view, easier since they are performed in the usual way. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it is just to, to move uh, over the, the matrix and uh, essentially, clearly, you have more possibility since the way in which you can reduce, you can transform the tensor. I mean, you have more possibility than the a matrix, but essentially, I mean, you are, you are there, I mean, you're not really doing different uh, things. When you see the contracted product, it appears more difficult, but probably it is easier to read, since what you say is that you have the calligraphic X uh, tensor, uh, sorry, this is the result, then you have two, um, sorry, X, it is the calligraphic, uh, X is a tensor of dimension uh, of order K plus N, and uh, the other is the tensor of order N plus M. When you have the contracted product among them, the result is a tensor of dimension uh, K plus M. Then the N inside disappears, and this is what you probably 
uh, understand a little bit easier. I mean, from a, a technical point of view, it is uh, more complicated, but it is the way where you pro take the product of two matrices, and the inner dimension disappear. This is uh, what, uh, what happened. Clearly, for tensor, it is a little bit compli more complicated, but essentially, it is the same. Okay, now, this is the first part. Uh, the first part to say that we are working with tensor and uh, of order three you see, since it is a cube, okay, of a bigger order it becomes a little bit more difficult. What we have learned is that there is a possibility to work with the tensor using similar way with the matrix algebra. Okay, as I said, I mean, the fact that you have order bigger than three uh, give you more possibility, and this is what you manage with the different uh, operators, okay? But now we move to the fact that the tensor admit also several interesting uh, representation of the composition, okay? Since it remains a quite complicated, okay, a quite complicated uh, tool, and in particular, what we consider as a, the, the interesting part is this parafac uh, decomposition. Parafac of rank uh, capital R here. And this means that you can decompose the tensor, in this case uh, of order um, N, in uh, once you define the define the rank, okay, the it is the uh, the outer product of uh, and then the sum the you first for each component you define the you see in the in in the representation below I mean you first uh, in some way see the, for the for the cube uh, you produce first uh, smallest uh, sorry simplest cube okay and then you sum of them okay the way which you represent overall is then using the the rank and then for each uh, dimension you have the component that is clearly as the same order of the tensor and at the end you obtain okay then uh, once we have this element i need to go much quicker now uh, you have the you can have a tensor representation okay then uh, for each entry of the of the response tensor then you can represent through a vec through a vector in this case beta i and then the vector the vector representing another uh, another uh, tensor. Clearly, if you put in a compact way, what you see to appear is uh, the tensor on the left as the ten response tensor. The input tensor becomes a, a vector since it is the it is vectorized. But uh, what what is in the middle then the coefficient? It is a tensor of a dimension of one dimension more than the uh, response tensor. And then in this case, it is a tensor of dimension of order n plus one. Okay, and then you add the error term. And the error term the uh, calligraphic epsilon noise that is a tensor that we introduce the tensor normal distribution that exists okay and uh, then uh, here it is possible to manage y, calligraphic y and calligraphic x of uh, tensor with different uh, order okay but it's also possible to include other regressors in the in uh, in the analysis here, then, uh, we can go to, I mean, it is possible to see the vectorized uh, form, as we said, but it is, uh, I mean, you can manage, but after, from a uh, uh, practical point of view, this is less of interest. Also, if t for analyzing the properties of the resulting uh, model, is, uh, is in, it is useful also to, to be able to work with this vectorized form. Uh, then, uh, the special cases clearly are the univariate regression, but no, nothing uh, new, and the multivariate regression. This means that it's possible to include the example as the VAR, the VECM, the panel VAR, and the SURE model. Okay, where it is interesting for us is to move to the special, the new special cases, and then this is the tensor autoregressive. And the tensor autoregressive is to not simply have the tensor. 
regression, but uh, to have uh, the dynamics there. And then to have the calligraphic YT uh, that, that can explain by the past calligraphic uh, y, YT. Okay, and then uh, to be able to have um, dynamics on, uh, on this. Uh, some uh, example of uh, matrix variate models are already in, uh, in the literature treated in a different way. Here they are put together in, uh, as we say, this uh, tensor autoregression. And uh, here it is the representation, uh, the ge ge general representation of order one, but clearly can be moved to the order P. And as I said before, it is possible to add other um, variable, other regressors. And then in such a way that it is not only an autoregressive, but an autoregressive with exogenous uh, uh, variable. Okay. Uh, in the paper, you find the properties of the autoregressive tensor that, uh, I mean, it can be analyzed in terms of uh, the contracted product. And uh, since it has uh, this uh, possible representation and where you remain simply using the tensor instead, instead of working with the vectorized, uh, at least for a part for the uh, input uh, tensor, okay, uh, and uh, I mean, working under mild condition, uh, it is possible to 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 see for under which uh, condition the process is weakly stationary and has then an infinite moving average representation. Uh, a sufficient condition uh, can be tested on the associated uh, var uh, model. Okay. And then here, uh, I mean, it is the properties, uh, the details are on the paper, then for the stationarity. Um, here it is the equivalent of our representation, as I said. Okay, the proposed uh, uh, parametrization. Now the proposed parametrization, if we consider the a restricted uh, var, then uh, the, to translate the then vectorized form, this means that the number of parameters that appear is uh, really uh, important, especially in terms of uh, covariances. Okay, then uh, using the tensor, the normal tensor uh, allow us to reduce first the, uh, the dimension of the covariances. And the second, using the parafac decomposition that have been introduced before, means that we can really move from a an in, in, infeasible number of uh, parameters to consider to something that is uh, feasible. Difficult to see, but probably in this graph you can understand better. The um, a restricted var is the what is exploding in terms of number of uh, parameters. If you work with uh, the parafac representation and then also the tensor um, representation of the error term, clearly it depends on the rank that you are considering, but the, 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 the number of parameters are highly reduced, but also increase in a quite linear uh, way. Okay, then uh, after what we have then, we have that we can work with tensor, in particular the the parameters that have to be estimated is a tensor, okay? And then uh, uh, the way in which we reduce this dimension is using the parafac decomposition. Then uh, there can be some issues in the, uh, the way in which the different marginals of the parafac decomposition are uh, used and considered. Then we need to impose some scale invariance, per permutation invariance. I mean, you have to work in such a way that the product that uh, we, we consider, I mean, give us something that is uh, meaningful. And um, what is... Uh, relevant uh, is that we have no specific interest in the marginals, but what we are interested in is the coefficient tensor, and these are always identified. And the problem, uh, the identification problem for the marginals, that not translate in identification problem for the coefficients, and uh, then uh, it is possible to work in a reduced way. Okay, then here it is the, the example of the uh, vectorized uh, 
form of the matrix autoregressive of order one, but since I have two minutes or zero minutes, one, <laughs> okay, uh, I go directly to the, very quickly to the prior specification, then also for the prior specification. Here it is the, um, what is used then it is the parafac. Okay, the parafac, uh, it, it becomes difficult with the parafac to use other uh, type of priors since, uh, um, I mean, working the vectorized it is impossible as we said, okay, the parafac is helpful since it's reducing, but uh, I mean, among the possibility to, to consider in terms of prior specification, the Yashica global local shrinkage prior appears to the way in which we can proceed. It is the way in which we can proceed since we have different level of commonality of information if you want, this is the global part, then there is a, a, the component part that is related to the component of the parafac decomposition and the local part that is specific for each entry. They are combined and uh, here it is, uh, you are also on the paper, the way in which they are combined and uh, they give the prior structure of, of the model and then it is possible to work and the posterior is through a Gibbs sampler. Uh, there is some uh, aspects that need to be take care during the, um, the Gibbs sample, but essentially you, you work in such a way. And then the nice things, and I go just to, to the end, it is the application. Here it is the matrix, uh, uh, it, it is the simplest, since it was the first example, you can have the same for the two layers, okay? And then uh, this is the matrix size, uh, mod three matrix size tensor, then it is, uh, uh, the layer, only the single layer network, then it is a 10 by 10, since we have uh, uh, the, the, double, uh, the double dimension, you go to uh, 100 by 100, since it is 10 by 10 and 10 by 10, and uh, what you can see is, uh, in terms of, of a color, each entry of this matricized tensor give the impact of edge J in T minus one to the edge I at time T. Okay, then, uh, then the regularity that you see that can appear, okay, comes from the fact that the uh, transaction in T minus one can have, have similar impact on all the transaction at time T. This is the way in which you can read. Okay, there is uh, other, uh, the impulse response function, but at the moment uh, I'm, I use my time till here. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Monica. So, questions from the floor or from the WebEx? So, uh, hello. Uh, Monica, you made a relatively tight connection between the tensor models and, uh, and the networks they imply. So, I was wondering whether, you, you, you would, whether you've also considered sort of applications to financial data where these tensors also come in naturally, like yield curves or option prices or any any anything where there are multiple countries and data over time, but also then a maturity dimension, so that there's always sort of three di dimensional matrices. But one wouldn't naturally think of these as networks or implied networks, but, but still there could be interesting applications. She could let first a few more questions. I think Luca had one. So Monica, sorry for making your questions to you. Uh, I hope you will not kill me. Now the fact, and also to Matteo, and uh, uh, now the fact is that when you're doing the parafarc, you use R, mm -hmm. and it's something that is fixed by you. You can, est you, is it possible to estimate it also, that kind of R or not, or is too much complicated, let's say also since the tensor structure is really heavy, heavy and, and complicated. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, uh, both of you for, for the questions. So uh, in reverse order, uh, yes, R is a kind of tuning parameter. You can consider that as uh, modeling uh, how flexible you are because the higher it is, the more flexible you are, the more parameters you have, and so this kind of trade-off that you can have. What we did uh, is to use information criteria to decide the value of R. 
it's very simple. So run several kind of estimation just to fix the best, the, the, the best one. You can estimate the answer is yes, uh, it's gonna be complicated. So you can do it parametrically or non-parametrically. Parametrically you go through reversible jump typically, non-parametrically can be much, much uh, more computational costly. But it, it, in principle it is possible. And for the data, I uh, fully agree. So if of course this presentation uh, was in the motivation for the paper starts from networks, uh, but uh, the, the, the methodology as it is just requires you to have a multidimensional real value array, whatever is the meaning of that. So you can typically use that for uh, the kind of data for, um, uh, from finance that you mentioned. So option prices or anything else, it's perfectly fine. We didn't do it there because we were concerned with the dynamic networks, but you can definitely work with them without problems, both in the, this paper and the other one, if it is a binary, you can just use it. So network is the application, but it is not uh, an ingredient which is key for the methodology to work. Thank you. Marta, so the first one was Bernd Schwab. <laughs> Next one is Marta Bambura, both from the uh, um, Ah, so Bernd, yes. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, so I wanted to ask because, so, so I, like it's, yeah, it's uh, not so easy to understand this notation, but I understand that this Padafax somehow introduces some homogeneity or some restrictions, how sort of like, you know, things propagate through the system. And I was wondering whether for like smaller system, you did some testing, like, you know, whether these restrictions are sort of like, you know, too much for the data. So like if you reduce the system, I don't know, to one or two or three variables, and you try your Parafac versus like a vectorized unrestricted system, like whether you have a sense how much of a restriction you actually put through this. <laughs> okay, uh, then uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, the question is also related on the way in which the rank is uh, is chosen for the parafac. Okay, what uh, clearly uh, this cannot be too too small. It cannot be one, two, three. I mean, it must be. We usually work at way the five, five, six. We also try till ten. Okay, but uh, on the specific uh, case to compare. Uh, the, the fact to remain vectorized instead to go through the parafac. The parafac, I mean, give you a way to uh, work with the tensor. Okay, it is not really since all the parameters that appear in the tensor are estimated. There is no restriction on. It is the way in which they are represented. But uh, I mean, it remain the, the full tensor remain there. Okay, it is not uh, reduced. Uh, it is reduced, it is a, so, a sort of rank reduction if you want, and this way you can read the, the parafac decomposition. But clearly, if you have a small one, then also the, uh, I mean, the interest in, in having the tensor and then the parafac decomposition disappear, since uh, clearly this is useful when you have important dimension, okay? Here the example is 10 by 10 that we have worked we, in the simulation, it was still 50 by 50 and was still feasible, but I mean, we, we, we also tried, Matteo better, tried also to go 100 and 100, but you see that in that case, you need to have a way to, to reduce the impact of the, the, the dimensionality. In terms of uh, application, I mean, Clearly, we really started as a, I make the history just to tell that this was the idea where we started. After it has been different research lines, I mean, also looking at the more methodological aspects. But really at the beginning it was how we can work with network and then their representation, and then to translate these in models and then a more better understanding of what, what, is, uh, what, what is happening. Okay, and also on uh, uh, term structure, we, we are working on this, there is a, some of the application is also on this. Here, clearly, the multi-layer dimension is important, but also the linkages among the different layers is important. And then, I mean, it is the dimension, but you have more constraints in some way that can go through the, the different uh, the different layers. But uh, yeah, it is one of the application that uh, we are already seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I also have a question, and uh, my question is to link uh, this stream of research to the topic of the conference, which is forecasting at risk. 
And I see that you talk about tensor normal distribution. So the first question is how easy it is to introduce uh, skew distributions? And the second question is uh, what, how can it help us to estimate tails of, uh, of the distribution of this complex object you're after? Uh, let me take the question from another point of view. I mean, here the application has been seen for network obtained from a trade or the relationship among the different uh, uh, performances, if you want, in uh, or the return on, on the market, but you can also see the network as they have been extracted from the covariances and then directly on the, on the way in which you represent risk, and then you can work directly on a different way to see also the skewness in, in, ter the, in terms of the distribution of the risk. Okay, and then, uh, I mean, this is a way in which you can treat, then instead of working on the first moment, let me say, work on the second moment for the to, to the extraction and the analysis, a part of the work, the work with uh, Daniele it has been, for example, for the network on the variances and not on the, on the first moment, just, just, just to understand. Okay, and then it is a way to represent directly the, the risk. Okay, clearly, if you maintain the tensor, the tensor regression, then you are looking at the first moment. Uh, um, I mean, to introduce a more complicated uh, form of the, um, the error term, okay, uh, this needs to have also the tensor representation. And, and this is a little bit more, uh, more complicated. Then to deal with the forecast of risk, I see better the way to, to move directly on the network from the uh, covariances than on the second order moment. In that case, you can manage different things Okay, and also to understood the way in which you have spillover, you have uh, okay, a part of the application is also in this in this direction. I hope to have more or less answered it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Actually, it, it comes to mind uh, um, a section uh, from uh, the Econometrica paper by Diebold and co-authors, which was called VAR for VAR, which then we have reutilized for a paper of mine. And that is exactly what you were saying. They were just estimating this vector autoregression on the value at risk, on the risk uh, uh, estimates directly. Thank you.